Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, I don't understand this. Um, if it had not been for the call that I just picked up, I would have wasted a lot of time because I was doing this video talking about this document. And let's see, that was page four. I made it all the way down to page four talking about this document and showing how this document is going to be utilized to help many of you who are dealing with unlawful detainers and foreclosures. Okay. This document is originally written out for Missouri. However, I will do it in a fashion. I will put it up to where you guys will be able to amend it to fit your situation. Did you say situation? That's what I said. Oh, okay. Situation. I ain't never heard that word before. That, that's an interesting word. Situation. Huh. Can I find that in the dictionary? Yeah, you just got to go ask your mama. She, she knows where it is. Oh. She says she's asleep. Well, then you have to wait till she wake up and then you ask her then, okay? No, as a matter of fact, go wake her up. Uh-uh, she ain't supposed to be sleeping. Go go wake her up. And, and Yeah, 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 let me know what happened. <sighs> Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, he's an idiot. Okay. Uh-oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let's undo that. Let's undo that and undo that. We're going to keep that right there and we're going to do that. That's what I want. I want some evenness, some uniformity. My mama told me about a uniform. Oh, God. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a petition to dismiss. Constitutional challenge cognizable at law for sanctions and attempting to commit fraud upon the court. Now, I am working on the other constitutional challenge document. That's this one right here. Again, this thing is only 13 pages long. I have been working on... Where you at? Where you at? I've been working on this document since 6 o'clock this morning. It is 4.50. Since I got up this morning, I've been working on this. I wanted to create a different format. And so each one of these are boxes where people can amend, fill in, and all that. They can add whatever they want. Okay? That's how this is done. It also has references. See that right there? Now let me give you the gist of the first set of pages. We're doing constitutional challenge. Now this is an affidavit supported by statements of claims. Because you're, you're not just going to state some stupid claim. You're going to state the claim. You're going to ask questions. You're not going to make any type of conclusions unless you can support those conclusions with actual law. So pay attention. Constitutional challenges uh, and questions. Uh, steady claim. This court has a constitutional duty, a duty to enforce the law as intended by Congress, who gets their authority, should, should we put, no, we can't put whom, who, gets their authority from the people of this great state. This court is said to be a court of law. My question is, if this is a court of law, then why does the court rely on statutes when statutes are only an appearance of law? Let's look at number one, shall we? Uh, the presumption in favor of the validity of a statute is ordinarily, ordinarily, only prima facie, only an appearance. But they have been declared conclusive where the statute has been long accepted and recognized as law. Huh? What does that mean? Well, see, there's a presumption of law. Presumption that a statute is valid. Yeah, yeah, it's only appearance that it's valid. Why? Because... The courts have been saying it's been valid all this time, so it's been long accepted, so that's conclusive. They've declared it, nah, -uh, we've already accepted it, and because we accepted it and y'all didn't rebut us, then y'all didn't act upon it, and once you act upon it, that makes it law. The only way you can get rid of that is by challenging it as unconstitutional. Pay attention. In this situation, <laughs> we do not think that the defendant should be heard to challenge the validity of of the amending ordinance on the procedural grounds here relied upon after the lapse of 14 years. This person waited 14 years, 14 years to challenge the statute. Pay attention, this is all coming from the same case. This court has repeatedly held in accordance with the general rule. There's a general, he's got a rule, that only person whose rights are directly affected by a statute may attack its constitutionality. Actually, that is not a true because everybody is affected by the statute because it's supposed to apply equally to everyone. 
if you understand what I just said, you can start attacking it. If you don't understand it, stay away from it. Likewise, the failure to raise an issue in a petition for leave to appeal results in a forfeiture of that issue before the court. Now, haha, <laughs> failure to raise an issue. However, in this court and all others, it has noted in the past a challenge to the constitutionality of a statute may be raised at any time. Anytime, 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 anytime. What about summer? Anytime. And what about winter? Anytime. What about spring? Anytime. What about winter? Anytime. Didn't I say winter? Anytime. Okay. Anytime. What about when I stub my toe? Anytime. 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 What about after I'm dead? Well, maybe not then. Now, maybe, maybe you can't raise it after you're dead. Okay. Constitutional challenge may be raised at any time. Pay attention. Allowing the defendant to challenge the constitutionality of a statute for the first time on a petition for rehearing. Ladies and gentlemen, this person challenged the constitutionality of a statute after his appeal and he demanded rehearing. Yay! We're going to the party! Anyway, let's continue, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen, the presumption in favor of the validity of a statute or ordinarily only prima facie evidence of nothing. It prima facie means appearance of. It appears to be, but it is not. A presumption, a so-called legal theory is not law has never been law. In fact, this stated fact, the word presumption does not even appear anywhere in law. Go ahead and take a look at the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, and see if you see the word presumption. The supreme law of the state is the Constitution. This is not an opinion. This is a fact that has been accepted generally by the people of this great state and the state legislature as well as the state courts. And now in this ring we have, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, the state court judges in Missouri are bound by the supreme law of the land as declared by the Supreme Court of the United States at Article 6 of the Constitution of the United States. We are bound not by a general declaration of law made by the lower federal courts. Ladies and gentlemen, who are the lower federal courts? Anybody know who the lower federal courts are? Anybody understood that there was any such thing as a lower federal court? Ladies and gentlemen, the lower federal court, pay attention. The lower federal courts are not those little district courts. Don't let them play that game with you. They purposely said lower federal courts because they're talking about the state. You guys don't understand, do you? So let's read the very first sentence. State court judges in Missouri are bound by the supreme law of the land as declared by the United States Supreme Court. Or the, I'm sorry, Scotia, Sco, 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 Supreme Court of the United States of America. Scotia. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Supreme Court of the United States of America is not the same as the United States Supreme Court. Keep that in mind. But as long as you keep that in mind, these lower federal courts are talking about courts like Missouri because they're all in a district. They're all district courts. Shh! Don't tell nobody. It's a secret. Number three says, a presumption is not evidence, but a rule of law. A presumption is not evidence? So why do they keep introducing it as evidence? Hold on. A presumption is not evidence? Well, prima facie is supposed to be evidence. But it's not evidence. Prima facie means presumption. Uh, yeah, an appearance. Not the actual thing. So a presumption is an appearance of something that may be, but it ain't. Until somebody proves it ain't. But it is a rule. It's a rule? It's a rule. Who does it rule over? Oh, it rules over the whole kingdom, the whole nation. It's a rule. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It rules over the law. Yeah, presumption rules over the law. So it governs, see, which governs until sufficient evidence 
to the contrary appears. So a presumption rules over the law or governs the law until somebody stronger and more powerful comes along and say, I'm Captain Caveman! Sounds stupid, doesn't it? That's presumption of law, people. Oh, Lord. I want you all to pay attention to this. In an unlawful detainer action, and this is Missouri code, in an unlawful detainer action, uh, no, that's, yeah, let's get rid of this. It's not in, it's an unlawful detainer act. Uh-oh, you did it right and then you didn't do it. Lawful detainer action is a creature of statute. An unlawful detainer action is a creature of statute. For Missouri statute is this, which states in part, unlawful detainer defined foreclosure notice to tenant. Let's get uh, right here. Right here. Hold on. Got to do it right, y'all. Because I can't do it wrong. That's why the whole world is singing this song. Jam on it. J j j j j jam on it. Yeah, yeah, you know. Hey, Cosmo! It won't let me do it. It let me do it before. Let's do this. That's right. We'll do it that way. Oh, you're going to indent on your own. You ain't even going to let me take care of nothing. Hold on now. Let me do it my way. It won't let me do it my way. It's going to only do it this way. Ladies and gentlemen, lawful detainer in Missouri is defined this way, a foreclosure. Notice the tenant procedure. Then it says when a person or such a person is guilty of an unlawful detainer. It literally says this in a statute. It says when a person stays in their home after it has been sold, they're guilty of an unlawful detainer. How can a person be guilty of an unlawful detainer? It is inconceivable that the statute would remove the innocence and or presumption of innocence or the due process right of a party and declaring them guilty, and it's not and, it's in declaring them guilty without a hearing. See, they are guilty. There's no hearing. They are guilty. Y'all understand what, I, what, what, what the law actually in Missouri, the statute actually says? It says a person who, and when you read the statute, this is the number, who stays in their home is guilty of an unlawful detainer. Guilty. I want you all to pay attention to this too. When you look at the federal statutes, it says a person who does this or that is guilty. Ladies and gentlemen, they are not guilty. They are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Okay? Shall be, it should be, shall be guilty after blah, 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 blah. But the statute says that they are guilty. Impossible. Ladies and gentlemen, let me explain to you this. Remember I tell you about the exceptions to the rule? Well, many laws there are exceptions to because a person can remain in their home after foreclosure sale and not be guilty of unlawful detainer. Why? Because it could be an unlawful foreclosure as in the case here. That's what makes the statute unconstitutional. Title 18, I only, at this very moment, am I only realizing that all of Title 18 talks about the individual being guilty. Ladies and gentlemen, the law cannot pronounce a person guilty. Only a jury can do that. Look at Constitutional Amendment number five. No one can be held to answer. No one. There has to be proof of guilt, not presumption of guilt. Oh, you have to reach a conclusion by a preponderance of evidence. No, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a preponderance of evidence. There's no preponderance of evidence statute anywhere in the Constitution. It's either they're guilty or they're not. Go back and look at the Constitution. Just like the judges when they have their sentencing guidelines. All oh, the sentencing guidelines only tell me I can do this, so I'm only stuck with that. Uh, give me a second, ladies and gentlemen. I got to go and pull down some curtains because we're getting to dark time, and I don't feel like people looking in on me while I'm looking out on them. I'm just looking out and just, you know, I don't want nobody looking in, and so I got curtains. Y'all like right, curtains for you, homie. All right. I'm stepping back over across the moat. Back, 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 back. And here I is. And let's see. Let's see. 
I'm charging up the battery I used all day. Really took it all the way down. It's like got 11%. And oh, you know what? It ain't charging. What the flying fart? It's supposed to be pulling all kind of wattage. It hasn't been charging all this time because the charging, uh, what you call it, wasn't all the way in. Dag nabbit, it's supposed to be because it charges at 60 watts. Okay, and it ain't it ain't charging at no 60 watts. Oh, ain't that about a ain't that about a ooh we ain't that something? All right, so pay attention, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind. The foreclosure process, whether judicial or non-judicial, does not determine a lawful detainer. Just because a person goes through foreclosure doesn't mean that they're involved in an unlawful detainer, that they're a part of an unlawful detainer. The foreclosure process is a process that violates due process when it takes into consideration non-judicial foreclosure. It's supposed to be when taken into consideration, non-judicial foreclosure. A foreclosure on a deed of trust and its security interests, which implies that it involves securities laws. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you guys are using the UCC. I just spoke with a young lady who has had quite a bit of success recognizing that foreclosures involve securities laws. They do not involve so-called UCC. Well, technically the UCC does involve securities, but not the way people have been using it. They've been going after foreclosure based on foreclosure and not based on the securities laws. Some of y'all are going to recognize, I'm about to show you one particular issue that this young lady brought to my attention, and I'm going to share it with you. That involves a security interest and or securities laws and or mortgage-backed security must have an SEC T1 license. Just type in SEC T1 form and you'll pull down the form. That's the OMB number, the Office of Management and Budget. Okay. The trustee is not authorized under the SEC Act and regulations of the SEC to deal with securities and a deed of trust. Okay, uh, it's, but it says it's only authorized, so they cannot deal with a deed of trust. A securitization trustee and the trustee for the security interests of the note, not the deed of trust, that trustee is only authorized to deal with securities. He cannot deal with anything else. Go and take a look at the regulations for that T1 and for the trustee of securities. Oops. Ladies and gentlemen, section number four, deed of trust cannot be transferred like a mortgage. Rather, the corresponding note may be transferred and carry with it the security provided by the deed of trust. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hold on to a second. This is a lie. The note may not carry with it the security provided by the deed of trust because security provided by the deed of trust is part of the note. Look, the deed of trust cannot be transferred like a mortgage, but the note can be. That's a lie, ladies and gentlemen, because if the deed of trust can't be transferred, pay attention, then how can it be transferred when the note is transferred? See, the corresponding note may be transferred and carry with it, yes, go with it being transferred the security provided by the deed of trust well the security is the deed of trust so it's impossible a deed of trust cannot be transferred Shh! don't tell nobody i didn't say this see they come up with all these little stupid technicalities a trustee over a deed of trust does not have the authority of appointing a servicer, nor does the servicer have the authority of initiating a foreclosure. When you guys get this notice of a servicer, where are you getting it from? Who's giving you notice of a new servicer? Where is the power of attorney? Where is the proof? You just receive a notice of assignment. That notice of assignment is not proof that it was the actual holder in due course who did it. So start asking for proof that they received authority from the holder in due course. By the way, you guys don't understand. The holder in due course is not who you think it is. It is not some bank. 
when it is converted to a security, the holder in due course is not a bank. It is not a trustee. The trustee does not have the authority of assigning a servicer. Go back and look at the Security Exchange Act. He does not have that authority. He can only deal with securities. He cannot assign a servicer. Go back and look at the Security Exchange Act. Shh, don't tell nobody. <sighs> Initiate a foreclosure as the servicer is not the holder in due course. A servicer cannot initiate a foreclosure. Pay attention. A servicer is not a party to the action. If anyone of you have ever been foreclosed on by a servicer, that is illegal. Servicers are not, well, let's go down. You see this thing number five? Let's double click on it. A servicer is not a party to the trust. Not a party to the deed of trust. I didn't say that. They've known that since 2009. Let's see if we can get back up to where we were. Okay? If the loan servicer is not a party to the deed of trust and not a holder of the note, how is it possible for them as an organization to initiate a foreclosure when there is nothing on the record which shows that they have the authority acting as an agent for the SEC, Security Exchange Commission, in violation of the security exchange policy, the only one who can initiate a foreclosure is the actual trustee. And when they take the note and they securitize it, that trustee has no authority to initiate a foreclosure because it's a breach and a violation of the dictates of the license for which he applied. To initiate a foreclosure, when they are strictly prohibited from exercising any other authority over a non-security as defined in statute. A deed of trust is not a security. A deed of trust is not a security. Go ahead and type it in case text. A deed of trust is not a security. Let's, let's do this. A deed of trust only documents security interest. So let's type in a deed of trust is not a security. Hold on. Come on now. Okay. Well, you know what? Deed of trust is in OTA and a deed of trust is not a security. A deed of trust is not a security. Just keep saying that to yourself. A deed of trust is not a security. This is Ohio. Thus, a trust indentured is not a security. Now, I like that part right there. A document containing the terms and conditions governing the trustee's conduct and the trust beneficiary rights. Okay, a trust indenture. That's the deed of trust. However, does not encompass the trust indenture. Okay? Thus, a trust indenture is not a security. A deed of trust is not a security. Let's see. Uh-oh. Come on now. We got to go down. A deed of trust is a security interest in a property similar to a mortgage. It's a security interest. It is not a security. A deed of trust lien is merely a security. No, it is not. It is a security interest. It is not the security. Y'all really need to understand that. However, a deed of trust is not a contract between the borrower and the lender. Actually, it actually is. That's why it's called a deed of trust. Rather, it is a document conveying an interest in real property as security for the performance of an obligation under a contract. <laughs> a deed of trust is not a security. A mortgage is the conveyance and is merely security that does not require consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, it does require consideration. Every contract requires value and consideration. These are just statements that courts have made over the years and people relied upon them. A deed of trust is a security interest, but it is not a security. The security is the mortgage when they convert it to a security. There's, it's called conversion. We'll talk about it in just a moment, okay? Hold on. How it is, as in the case here, that an attorney can introduce into the record documents which were not included in the initial filing, which is necessary to initiate foreclosure. 
In this instance, the attorney has introduced into the record a statement and or testimony of a note and a deed of trust. When the original record evidence is no note, and to do so appears to be an attempt to defraud my person, the public, from whom an interest exists in the instant matter. Yeah, the public is always interested in every single case because every single case is open to the public. The D and the court itself, it is holy, holy kamali true that the note is the security. The deed of trust only evidences the security. Is this not true? Then why has the note been separated from the deed of trust and securitized and under the Securities Act and the SEC's regulation, once that securitization has taken place, cancels the note and creates a new instrument, i.e. a security which is traded on the market as a mortgage-backed security as evidenced by the pooling and servicing agreement. Oh, mama. He's speaking over our heads. Well, I'm not speaking over the heads of the people who've been doing this for years. I am not speaking over their heads. That I guarantee you. Let me see. Did we have a footnote here? I don't think we had a footnote in this one. No, we didn't have no footnote there. Where the footnote at? There got to be a footnote. Oh, no, that's number five. That was up above. Uh, wait, wait, up above. You know, up on the roof. Where's number five at? That's number four. Number five, well, yeah, there, right there, five, five, right there, not a party. Okay, hold on, y'all. Let me, let me, let me, let me explain something to y'all. Is it not true that in order for a foreclosure to take place on a deed of trust, there must be evidence of a loan? That evidence is provided by the note itself. So, where is the holder in due course? The owner of the note. Yet. There is no power of attorney on record from the holder in due course authorizing the attorney and or any other attorney to represent its interests. If the true party of interest has never properly been represented, how are these proceedings moving forward? How did the foreclosure actually happen without there being some sort of power of attorney allowing a trustee under a T1 license of the SEC to violate such license? and participate in a trustee's deed sale when the Security Exchange Commission's regulations and policy prohibit such activity. Go and take a look at your deed of trust. The trustee is not whomever they choose, it's whomever the so-called beneficiary chooses. Through the transfer. There are not two different trustees, but you pay attention. Every single one of you have two different trustees. You have the trustee with the servicing, agreement the one who's doing the servicing and you have the securitization trustee that's two separate trustees one of these things is not the same thing one of these things do not belong do not let them bring two different trustees you need to find out who the actual trustee is this idiot ain't the trustee where is the uh, agreement authorizing this trustee to act on behalf of the beneficiaries. Remember, as long as they securitize the notes, there are hundreds of beneficiaries. As long as it's part of a pooling and servicing agreement and a mortgage-backed security, there are hundreds of beneficiaries, which means they will need all of their signatures on some document authorizing any of this. Pay attention. <sighs> Do you know under the United Uniform Commercial Code, Article 8, Section 103, Missouri is 8400.8-103A. I mean, at D, sorry. That's at D. A writing that is a security certificate is governed by this article and not by Article 3 of this chapter. So, a uh, writing that is a security certificate, that's, that's, that's your, your mortgage, okay? Pay attention. It, 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 it is not governed by Article 3, which negotiable instruments. Not governed by that article, but pay attention. Even though it also meets the requirements of that article. Negotiable instruments. However, a negotiable instrument governed by Article 3 of this chapter is a financial asset if held in a security account. Ladies and gentlemen, a negotiable instrument governed by Article 3 of this chapter is a financial asset if held in a securities account. Security and Exchange Commission, ladies and gentlemen. Mortgage-backed securities, if held in a securities account. Well, if it's a 
financial asset, a mortgage? Well, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. They have taken the mortgage and they've just mute brutalized that thing. Pay attention. We got sell this note. The one associated with the alleged foreclosure sale was not a security at all, but a financial asset. That leads a lot of questions and answers, such as under Missouri law, the security that was created is not a security at all, but a financial investment. It's just not correct. Did and how could the trustee acting under the authority of the securities laws enforce a financial investment and not a security? Pay attention, trustee cannot enforce a financial investment. He has to enforce a security. When the security exchange license prohibits him from doing so, he can only deal with securities. Shh, don't tell nobody. That's what happens when they start writing all these stupid laws. Uh, the people who wrote the UCC did not get together with the people who wrote the actual statute. Conversion of an instrument. Uh oh, we gotta do some conversion. Man, I had me a Dodge conversion. Yep, had me a conversion. My mother got converted when she was five years old. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, she was going to preschool, and then she decided she didn't want to go to preschool anymore, and so they converted her over to first grade. Yep, conversion. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, UCC Article 3-420 at A. The law applicable to conversion of personal property, your home, applies to instruments, negotiable instruments. Pay attention. An instrument is also converted if it is taken by transfer. Oh, we're going we're gonna to transfer this over to this bank and we're going to sign it. Other than a negotiation. Other than a negotiable instrument. So a negotiable instrument is not converted if it is taken by transfer. See, the transfer doesn't convert the negotiable instrument. What transfers it is, pay attention, securitization. From a person not entitled to enforce the instrument or the bank who makes or obtains payment with respects to an instrument for a person not entitled to enforce an instrument or who receives a payment. Any action of conversion of an instrument may not be brought by the issuer or the acceptor of the instrument, a payee or an endorser who did not receive delivery of the instrument either directly or through delivery of an agent. This is why the banks get to do what they want. Because they can pretend that they're entitled to enforce the instrument when they're not entitled and they cannot be held liable. That's why they put that there. Because this happens all the time, ladies and gentlemen. All the time. In an action under subsection A, the measure of liability is presumed to be the amount payable on the instrument, but recovery may not exceed the amount of the plaintiff's interest in the instrument. So you can only get what the value of the instrument is. They cannot prove that they're the holder in due course. The person I'm working with, uh, she's asked me to work with her. She's asked me to send some of you to her. If you contact me, you will, I guarantee you, you will not get any headway. I will let you know when it is time for y'all to contact her. We are working something out. So shut it up. A representative other than a depository bank who has in good faith dealt with an instrument or its proceeds on behalf of one who was not a person entitled to enforce the instrument is not liable for the conversion to the person beyond the amount of any proceeds that it has not paid out. Ladies and gentlemen, all that's saying is this right here. As noted above, it is not believed that the trustee is entitled to enforce the instrument. And shame on the trustee for exercising such a presumption. This is precisely the conundrum, conundrum, conundrum of utilizing presumptions. So long as a party can violate due process and then presumption of law is unconstitutional. So long as they can violate due process, presumption of law is unconstitutional. For under presumption of law, the trustee can commit fraud against my person, as has been the case here, and then simulate a lawful action without any authority and or reliance upon any fundamental due process principles, and the law places the burden upon my person, and should I fail to raise objection, the law will say that I have violated some statute of limitations, again, fundamentally, 
uh, law of the statute of limitation, then it's again fundamentally definition. Give me one second. Let me make sure that I put something here. Uh, it's the case. Where is that case thing? Case here. I got to wait for my computer to catch up. I apologize, y'all. We are going to be going over an hour because I'm going to do the whole document. I, I really wish you guys will understand how much I started this earlier and it didn't take the uh, recorder started over again. So as alleged case here, can't accuse nobody of fraud. You can only allege that they are attempting to commit fraud. Again, fundamentally, the definition of denial of due process and unconstitutional, and I bring forth my challenge respecting such. Were you aware of the constitutional requirements? Now, here are the two questions. Now, this is not the same. They are the same questions, but this is not the same as the constitutional challenge document that I'm still working on. I thought I'd have it finished by today, but I did remember that this gentleman, he has until January 4th. So I have to get this done. So I will finish the other one, but this one was necessary. Look, <clears throat> as far as, <clears throat> that's my voice going. And I apologize. As far as those of you who want me to put you in touch with the young lady because you're in dire straits, keep that crap to yourself. I mean, I'm li literally serious. I don't care about your situation. You are one person. You are not going to mess it up for everybody else and your selfishness is uncalled for. So I'm letting you know, don't do it because I will scratch you off any list. You will not get access to anything. Okay, you will wait until I can get to it. You are not the only thing on my agenda. Told you it took me now going on 11 hours just doing no, we'll be 12 hours and um, 15 minutes, um, well, 20 minutes, sorry. 12 hours working on one document. So please don't think that you are so important that I'm going to drop everything and I'm just going to help you because your situation is so dire. You're only going to piss me off. And I'm sorry, but I'm in such a good mood tonight. So shut it up. All right, let's get to this, shall we? You saw how my voice was starting to go, okay? That's not me because I've been talking all day. I haven't been, well, I have been talking into the computer, but I haven't been talking all day. <sighs> Seems that this is the case by appearance. So my question is, Whereas the third section of Article 6 of the Constitution says, Senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and the executive and judicial officers, see, you're calling in all of these, not just the judge, you're calling in everybody who signed these so-called statutes, both in the United States and the several states shall be bound by oath of affirmation to support the Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. And whereas an act to regulate the time and manner of administering certain oaths is the first law passed by the United States Congress after the ramification of the Constitution. Ramification? Ramification. No, it's ratification. But I say ramification. Okay. Whereas 1 U.S.C. 112, pay attention, statute at large, contents admissibly as evidence, mandate that the United States statute at large shall be legal evidence, not law, but legal evidence of law, not apparently the law of the land in all courts of the United States and several states and territories and the insular possessions of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, this is illegal because this is coming from a statute. The statute is declaring statutes at large legal evidence. Statutes cannot do that. The Constitution has to do that. Pay attention. Since the court operates on a presumption of law, a presumption is not evidence, but it is the rule of law which governs until sufficient evidence to the contrary appears. And because it appears that a presumption violates due process, clause of the first, fourth, fifth, let's get the comma. 
and let's put my, my favorite little symbol there, and Fifth Amendment. Okay? You know what? I see what it's saying. It's saying if you put and there, you don't need the comma. I got you. I got you. To the United States Constitution, as such appears to violate an individual's right to innocence until proven guilty. It's not a presumption. You're not presumed innocent. You are innocent. The Constitution does not say you're innocent until proven guilty. The Constitution says no one can be held to answer for a crime. Unless and upon blah, 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 blah. So it's not innocence until proven guilty. You are innocent until you are proven guilty. Now, my, by the way, they don't prove you guilty. They presume you're guilty. Go ahead. It's a preponderance of evidence. It's a beyond a reasonable doubt. So beyond a reasonable doubt is not proof, ladies and gentlemen. It's a belief. Impossible. Let's continue. If all one need to do is to bring forth sufficient evidence to the contrary, this would mean that a presumption could be utilized to disprove a presumption which apparently finds no standing, no ground, nor foundation within the Constitution of the United States as determined by the people of the United States when mandating that no person shall be held to answer for a crime nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Sorry. No, we got to put that on the outside. It don't like the things on the inside. The courts have presumed that this apparently applies only to criminal matters. See, when it says that you have a due process right, well, the reason why they took the Fifth Amendment from you all, your due process right in the Fifth Amendment and gave you the Fourteenth Amendment, is because they said this applied to criminal matters. So let's prove that it doesn't apply to criminal matters. The courts have presumed that this applies to criminal matters, but the deprivation of right to life, liberty, and or property does not always involve a criminal matter. Not that the Fifth Amendment applies, or I think it's note. Note that the Fifth Amendment applies to civil matters as well. Okay. Yeah, we don't need a question mark. No, actually, we do need a question mark because that is a question. Note that the Fifth Amendment applies to civil matters as well. And that to bring forth evidence that is not solidified and or based on reality that is conclusive denies the party the right to innocence yeah you can't bring a presumption you have to bring law so let's continue uh party the right to innocence and not to be deprived of life liberty and or property ladies and gentlemen property you're being deprived of property it's not a criminal matter it's a civil matter look at the civil forfeiture laws as presumption of law would violate due process clause of the Constitution of the United States of America. But since this section right here, 1 USC, statutes at large, contents admissible as evidence, mandates the United States statute at large shall be evidence, apparently, wait a minute, hold on, what just happened? This ain't supposed to be, we just went over that. Okay, I gotta get rid of that. I added that twice and I thought I may have done that. Okay, give me one second. Since the court, and let's make sure it doesn't say since the court. Okay, that's what I need to get rid of. No, this was correct. In the courts of the United States, several states, uh, let's get rid of what I put there that right there let's get rid of that and we're gonna do that in the courts of the United States several states how is it possible for a presumptive code this is a presumption this is a prima facie a presumptive code where only the title is construed as positive law can regulate what is or not evidence of law remember the statute is only prima facie evidence, only the positive title, not the actual code itself, but the title is prima facie evidence. I mean, that's like the pot calling the kettle black, the dog disliking the wolf because it presumes it is not a canine. On the 
in other words, it doesn't make any sense. How can you take something that is not, presume that it is, unless somebody comes up and says it doesn't, or no, not that it doesn't, it isn't. Sorry. And then propose that it isn't. Nope. Uh, it isn't, and then propose that it isn't, and it remains a fact. Oh, and says that it isn't, and then propose that it isn't, and then it remains a fact. The, it, it sounds confusing, huh? That's presumption of law. All somebody's got to do is say something is when it really isn't, and then someone else come up and say it isn't when it really is, and then propose that it isn't when it really isn't, and then it remains a fact when it really isn't, or it is not. Oh, mama, he just confusing the rest of us. He done confused the, out of me and my grandmama and my grandpapa. They both rolling over and tossing up dust and everything and putting sackcloth on because this mother just, just uh, sat up there and just disturbed them all about it in sleep. That's presumption of law, ladies and gentlemen. In a nutshell, a presumption is basically somebody gets to come up with a theory. Do you guys know that evolution is a presumption? No. Ha, 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 hold on. Not going to kill the messenger. Evolution did happen. Not with man, with animals. Evolution did happen. Not with man, with animals. Not every animal. See, a butterfly, caterpillar, go through evolution. A frog, tadpole, goes through evolution. Evolution does happen in nature, but not with man. There is no documented history. That's why they're looking for the, pay attention, missing link. So we can continue. May not finish the whole document. This thing is 20 pages long and we're only on page six. Now, hold on. There is one absolute truth. No one can challenge. Okay, I, that, that right there, I gotta do this right here. T-H-A-T, there's only, there is one absolute truth that no one can challenge. And that is, you cannot have two truths. Either something is the truth or it is not. Either a statute is law or it is not. As has been demonstrated, it is fundamentally agreed upon by the courts that statutes are not law. It doesn't matter what statement is made afterwards, what words are conjoined together to create some sort of spell or statutes or codes or regulation or ordinances. Uh, okay, statutes, codes, regulations, see, some sort of spell. We got to get rid of A because we're starting a new sentence conjured up to create some sort of spell. Statutes, code, regulations, ordinances are not law when we are referencing the supreme law of the land. This is not, uh, excuse me, it's supposed to be, is this not correct? That's the second time it did that. Get me that right there. Is this not correct? And again, it would be helpful if we got precise answers from the court because this matter involves everyone who enters through the doors, either electronically, telephonically, video conferencing, and or physically. In other words, stop giving us that gobbledygook, that, that junk where you're giving us non-definitive answers. Answer the question definitively, mother... Okay, other evidence and questions supporting this affidavit. Since the fees associated with the court are budgeted into the yearly budget for the court, that is applied by the courts through the administrative office of the United States courts. It did, uh, and that's, it's supposed to be, is it not? Is it not double jeopardy, a violation of the Fifth Amendment of the United States of America's Bill of Rights guaranteed and prohibition against such a deprivation to require a citizen, a taxpayer, to then pay the court a second time after they have received an annual budget allocation? What does not, um, um, it's supposed to be does this not amount? Does this not amount to unjust enrichment? Oh. 
I, that was right. I don't even know why I changed that. Does not the Constitution prohibit the government, whether local or national, from subjecting the citizenry to deprivation? Number six, each county officer, including judicial officers, are required to submit and justify their budgets for tax purposes, and the Board of County Commissioners are required to oversee the fiscal expenditures of each official. Where it becomes necessary to cover unforeseen expenditures of our statute, of our statute, of our statute, provide for emergency expenditures. The Board of the County Commissioners by law are the business managers of county government, charged with the daily operations of county government within strict budgetary requirements. Administrative documents include fiscal records detailing how Ohio courts are spending taxpayers' dollars. Thus, the implication is that this court can unilaterally exempt itself from public scrutiny of its financial dealings, commercial dealings, people. That runs counter to the clear statutory text and evident purpose of Public Records Act and to the principles of the Public Records Act and the principles of good governance the act supports. Ladies and gentlemen, you can request the financial records of the court under the Public Records Act. You can prove that the courts engage in commercial business. Oh my stars, I think he done gave us some nuggets. Go over the Public Records Act, ask them for their comprehensive annual financial reports, inclusive of notes, references, term definitions, and ledgers, and you will see that they are privately owned, and you will tell them that none of the information in there is private information, so please do not redact the names of the owners of certain held securities. The courts have a practice of requiring fees for transcripts and records and or copies of records. How was this possible when accommodations by, by a budgetary mechanism scheme already in place uh, when accommodations for budget uh, uh, a r e are already in place does not requiring these additional fees after they have already been accounted for and set aside and this is supposed to be in the annual budget for the court amount to double jeopardy when taken into account with Congress, congressional budget that is delegated to the courts through the administrative office of the courts. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can't answer that uh, because I'm doing the video and so we're going to decline that call because I that particular person, I've already told him, after a certain time in a the day, they're in a different time zone, four hour difference, but I can't handle stuff later in the day because I'm just too tired, y'all. Judicial Conference Committee, with input from the courts, advised the Administrative Office of the United States Courts as to develop the annual judicial budget and approval of the United States Congress. What this does, this rebuts anybody claiming that you have to pay a filing fee. It is my belief that this successfully rebuts any presumption that I am required to pay such fees. I do hereby challenge such a process and or procedure requiring payment of fees a second time to access the judicial branch of government. There has been no evidence placed on any record with the exception of a presumption that I am required to pay fees to obtain redress by way of an appeal to the court to assist me and I do hereby bring forth my formal constitutional challenge to any such requirement, any rule or statute as a violation of my right to process, access to court, and to redress. Constitutional challenge. Now, here's the next section. Please be patient with me as I try to further wrap my mind around the reasoning as to how such practices could be constitutional. I mean, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution's Bill of Rights guarantees every citizen as well as every person in the United States the right to petition government of the United States for a redress of grievance. It even goes as far as to say Congress shall not make budgetary rule, statutes at large, federal code, federal ordinance, penal code, 
penal ordinances, regulations, procedures act, mandates, or other mechanisms that interferes with the law prohibiting and or obliging, not ob obliging, um, A, B, and R, D, I think obliging, let's see if it has the E. Okay, see, sometimes it's without the E, sometimes it's with the E, so that's why I just wanted to check. The right of the people to petition the government for redress agreements. So, if courts still receive an annual budget and the courts are required to document the necessity for such a budget, how is it that every time I try to petition the government for redress agreements that I have to either pay a fee, fill out a waiver, or beg for assistance? I do not think that it was the will of the people. I do not believe that there was a constitutional amendment, a bill of rights, whether on the state level or on a national level, that would permit the government to charge the people twice to obtain access to the resources and or redress. If the right to petition government for redress agreements is a secured right delineated in the Bill of Rights of the United States of America Constitution, how is it that the government has stated that an individual in order to obtain redress via an appeal needs some sort of statutory authority authorizing such? When it is judicial knowledge, and please take notice, this is we're telling the court to take judicial notice, that the word and or term redress in its legal context implies an appeal to government to correct the wrong for reparations, for relief, for remedy. Does this not even suggest, um, uh, S-U-G-G-E-S-T, in the slightest degree, no, it was right, it was in the slightest degree, amount to, so even in the slightest degree, so I, I said suggest, and I need to get rid of suggest, but now I got the little hourglass, and it ain't letting me do nothing. So come on now, let me do something. We're stuck, y'all, so give me a second. I think, nope, give me a second. When I went over it earlier, I thought the same thing, but even suggest in the slightest degree, amount to an appeal right, so, how can the government on either the national level or local level deny access to redress by stating that an appeal may only be had by leave of the court? The law says that each person shall be secure in a person's possessions, things, assets, properties, homes, and that only way to dispossess a party from these things is via, and it's going to want me to put R, I know A-R-E, Oh, no, it didn't do it. Oh, it accepted it. A warrant based on probable cause. It appears that probable cause always implies judicial determination and that judicial determination references probable cause. Referencing probable cause requires sworn testimony and evidence to be presented before a judicial officer. Isn't this the essence of a hearing? If a witness testimony is required in order for my property, my possessions, and or my person to be seized, and or my rights, and, uh, excuse me, or, it's, let's do not or, am I not under the most fundamental principles of due process to be afforded the opportunity of being present before deprivation occurs? Ladies and gentlemen, if they want to take your property, they need a witness testimony. They don't just get to come take your property. No warrant shall issue. Every person shall be secure in their possession unless and upon probable cause. Shh. Which means that a hearing where a party is requesting possession of my property, any hearing where a party is requesting possession of my property, possessions, persons, effects, papers, am I not to be afforded an opportunity to be present at such hearing, prior to the issuance of any such order for deposition of my property and or rights associated with my property, the court is said to be operating under the judicial branch of government, which means the court has constitutional delegation. So the question is, why is the court relying on presumption in order to deprive American citizens, members of the public, the people, the rights secured them by the Constitution that are in 
Oh, despite the prohibition. Uh, it's not unusable. Inalienable, okay? Despite the prohibition against such situations, if the court and other officers of the court, i.e. attorneys, can rely on court opinion, what often termed as case law, let's see, W-H-I-C-H is often termed as case law. Uh-oh, how'd you jump all the way back when I know I had you right there? Okay. Let's put our comma on the inside. Are not the equal protection principles of the Declaration of Independence applicable and are not other members of society afforded the same right and the same credence when utilize such documents, documented opinion sites, basically we're saying we use case law, you're junk, coast law, and you interfere with us using coast law. Morons. That's what it's saying. Okay, let's continue. Since Congress has held that a statutes are only prima facie evidence of law, does not the Constitution require that the law... The evidence on the record, B, oh, it's not the, it's B evidence on the record. Okay, so it's B evidenced on the record when making application of statute, code, ordinance, regulation. Code, uh, let's do that. To any member of the public, the people, the American citizens, American nationals, American natives, if neither the code, statute, regulation, or ordinance, or the prima facie legislation is only prima facie, Latin, on first appearance, a fact presumed to be true unless disproved, a common parlance that prima, the term prima facie is used to describe the apparent nature of something upon initial observance, then by definition, it is not law, only presumption of law, which is not supported by due process of law. Due process of law does not require one to rebut the presumption for the law of maxim holds that. Various authorities have taken that position and assert that every man is presumed to know the law and some aver that such presumptions is conclusive, a principle which if carried to its logical conclusion, would render the judges of inferior courts liable to impeachment when reversed on questions of law. Frequently, presumption is stated as the equivalent of the maxim. Give me a second. I'll finish reading that in a minute. I just wanted to read this. A law listed in the current edition of the United States Code is prima facie evidence of the law of the United States. Whether a statute has been enacted into positive law only concerns where one looks to find the official wording of the statute. No, it doesn't only concern that. Although the statute has not been enacted into positive law, the statute at large of the United States Code constitutes, the statute at large in the United States Code constitutes prima facie legal evidence of the law of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing. You cannot have prima facie legal evidence on mere appearance. It's either the law or it is not. You cannot have two truths. Either it's the law or it is not. We're going back to the equivalent of a maxim. Ignoramus <laughs> ignorantia legis nemian excuse. Ignorance of the law is inexcusable, which is very a very different proposition. The general rule that ignorance of the law excuses no one is sanctioned by both the Anglo-American and Roman and civil law systems. Roman or civil law systems. It is not rooted in dogma, but is based on consideration of expediency and necessity. The public advantages of the rule vastly outweigh the occasional individual inconveniences. This is what these idiots have said, ladies and gentlemen. They can violate your 
rights so long as they can get the stuff through the courts. That is simply to say that if everyone is required to know the law, as ignorance of the law is inexcusable, then such a conclusion would require... Uh, give me one second. One. To know a presumption. And we go back. And we go A P P E A R to B. There appears to be no authority. And um, we've got to give me an S. Give me an S. Uh, okay, okay, uh, Pat. Uh, I, I'll take um. You get on my mother nerves for four hundred. Okay. Anyway, there appears to be no authority holding that a party is required to know and or defend a presumption or be liable for a presumption, which means that a presumption is not the law. See, you are required to know the law, but you are not required to know a presumption. Ignorance of the law is inexcusable, but ignorance of a presumption is not. With this. Uh, this is what this W O U L D. Would this not be a correct understanding that ignorance of a presumption of law is excusable under law? Yay! What has Congress to say on the issue of what law is? We take special notice of the following information. As per the Constitution, Congress shall make no law has been understood to imply that Congress is the lawmakers within the borders of the United States. Positive law titles and non-positive law titles. Positive law codification by the United States Office of Law Revision Council is the process of preparing and enacting codification bills to restate existing laws as a positive law title, a positive law title, only the title, not the code, of the United States Code. The restatement, in other words, redoing it, why? Because they have to represent it, okay? Conforms to the policy, intent, and purpose of Congress in the original enactment. But, see, it, 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 it conforms to the policy, intent, and purpose of Congress in the original enactment. Well, why can't it be the original enactment? But the organizational structure of the law is improved. Wait a minute, you organized it and improved it? Obsolete provisions are eliminated. Obsolete provisions? Congress don't do no obsolete. Ambiguous provisions are clarified by who? Not by Congress. Consistent with provisions, uh, inconsistent provisions are resolved and technical errors are corrected. No, Congress has to do that. The Office of Revision Council doesn't get the correct technical errors by Congress. Sorry. The term positive law. What does the term positive law mean? The term positive law. Positive law is a term? The term positive law has a long established meaning in legal philosophy, but has a narrower meaning when referring to titles of the code. Positive law title versus non-positive law titles. The code is divided up, blah, 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 blah. We're not going to read this again. We've already covered that. This is just showing just right here. Let me make sure y'all understand. Statutory text opinion in positive law title is the text of the statute. The text of the statute. Yeah, well, anyway. Statutory text appearing in positive law title is the text of the statute. We don't care about the statutory text because a positive law title is the positive law title. And it's presumably identical to the statutory text appearing in the statutes of large. Presumably? By first appearance, prima facie, because a positive law title is enacted as a whole by Congress, only the title, and the original enactments are repealed, the original statute at large, pay attention, is repealed. The original statute at large does not re exist. This is coming from the Congress's website, ladies and gentlemen. The original statutes at large are eliminated and they are replaced. Let me see if I can do this. I need you all to do me a favor. If you're going to pay attention to anything I have to say about the law, pay attention to this. Statutes at large are prima facie evidence of law. 
Do your research. You will see statutes at large are prima facie evidence of law. But, however, the code relies upon the statutes at large because the code is supposed to be the statutory text for the statutes at large. Okay, now hold on, because we're rebutting a presumption. If the statutes at large is now converted into a code, pay attention, because the positive law title of the code is enacted as a whole by Congress, and the original enactment, the original statute at large, are repealed, the statutory text appearing in the positive law title has congressional authoritative imprintor, meaning the seal of Congress, with respects to the wording of the statute. Ladies and gentlemen, only the title is positive law. The wording of the statute is not because the statute has been repealed. The statute at large is repealed. The original enactment is repealed. The code is only supposed to support the original enactment. You, All you got to do is look this junk up. Recourse to other sources such as the statutes at large is unnecessary. Why? Because it's been repealed. When proving the wording of the statute, unless proving are unlikely technical errors in publication process. No, because it's been repealed. Every statute at large which has been codified and deemed positive law, once it becomes positive law and it's enacted by Congress as positive law, the original statute at large is repealed. That's unconstitutional, ladies and gentlemen, because the so-called code is only prima facie evidence and only the title is so-called law. Ain't that a shame? <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, a positive law title is basically one law enacted by Congress in the form of a title of the code. The organization, structure, designation, and text are exactly as enacted by Congress, which is a lie, ladies and gentlemen. Too many mistakes. We've already talked about it. There are well over 600 mistakes in the code. In the case of a positive law title prepared by the Office of the Law Revision Council, the title was enacted as a restatement of the existing statute that were previously contained in one or more of the non-positive law titles, and it repeals the original enactment, which is the statute at large. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you can get all of this information, not, not Missouri, uh, you can get all of this information here. Let me get the link for you because it is here. First session of the Act of August 10th, 1956, blah, 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 blah. You get all that about positive law there. Or you can go directly to Congress. Just type in positive law title versus non-positive law title and go to the congressional website and you'll see this page. It's in yellow. Okay? Okay? Okay! Now, we're going to talk about misery. Every state has the very same thing, so you can look it up in your state. Okay, let's check the great state of misery. We are certain that it will be different. I'm positive that it'll be different. Revised statute of misery. Merge there. Revised statutes are no more than prima facie evidence of statute. And revisers, absent of legislation act, amending a section, have no authority to change substantive meanings of the law. Wait a minute. The revised statutes in a state or the penal codes are prima facie evidence of law? That's all you got to do is take, like, Arizona revised statutes. Just type that in. Arizona revised statutes are prima facie evidence of law. They are not law. People, they are not law. But as long as the people think they're law and obey them, they're under obligation. Well, there it's well, 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 well. Look what we have here. Well, there you have it. Even in Missouri statutes, or excuse me, even the Missouri statutes are not law. So where is the court getting its constitutional authority to act? I must ask again, 
Is this or is this not a court of law? Or is it a court of statutes? Or is it a court of prima facie evidence? Or is it a court of presumptions? Let's do URT of two C's in a court because one court got to go. Yeah, that's not the right court. Anyway, if it is more than one of these, then there must be some sort of statutory authority which permits it. And there must be some sort of notice to the public whereby they have authorized such conduct by the court. Where can this be found? Because I have looked and I have not found any such statute, ordinance, code, and or constitutional amendment where the people have consented to such conduct. Because even that, it appears, would be unconstitutional if not at all levels on the very... Um, L E A S T. Uh oh. Okay. Summary. As noted, the opposing party through his counsel notified the court that I somehow stated that I have two properties and that the property in question in the instant matter is my homestead. I must apologize for any misunderstandings. The opposing counsel has already checked the county record as and is well aware that I have only one permanent resident and it is the property that's in question. Okay? T-H-H-A. Speculation and or irrelevant, frivolous, or meritless presumptions are unwarranted. Okay? The opposing counsel represented the alleged plaintiff, alleged because there was no claim before the court, as the only way the court can enforce an unlawful detainer is if the foreclosure statute had been complied with. It had already been presented before this court that the trustee had no authority under the securities laws and our regulations to initiate a foreclosure sale of a property, whether or not associated with a deed of trust. See the SEC rules and regulations respecting a trustee and a T1 license. These federal regulators must be complied, regulation must be complied with for the trustee cell to be valid. It appears that the trustee cell is invalid and I've called into question, do I not have the right? Has stated that he placed the note and the deed of trust on the record, thus indicating knowledge that without the note, the deed of trust has no value because the deed of trust references the note and the note on the other hand does not reference the deed of trust. So the deed of trust without the note invalidates any claim. The deed of trust refers to a loan having been received. The SEC filing, the SEC filing, pay attention, the SEC filing will document that the mortgage and or the note were securitized. The original lender placed on the record proof that it had been paid in full. The SEC has this proof. The barcode at the bottom of the original note, along with the SEC filing associated with that barcode and the internal documents for the original lender will solidify this point. And I do have the right to bring forth such evidence before the court and I must hereby demand that the court convert this matter to a civil action as is proper, as my challenge to the unlawful detainer statute is as being invalid, being unconstitutional, and not being law, especially because it holds a party guilty without due process of law, which violates the Fifth Amendment prohibition against such finding, as well as the basic maxim standard, hold on, of the U.S. jurisprudence and must be decided by jury as is my right. He's demanding a jury trial. He's already done that. He's doing it again. We must remember that just because Congress creates a statute stating that a process is called an unlawful detainer and or proceeding and or procedure 
must incorporate within its framework due process of law. The very law, uh, excuse me, due process of law. Where's my due process of law? As stated, okay, I went too far. The very law in and of itself states that a party is guilty prior to a hearing. Again, this is an unconstitutional determination as the law holds that a determination of guilt can only be had in a court of law, not through a summary proceeding. And I object and challenge the statute as unconstitutional. Sorry, my dogs are telling me they need to go for a walk, so we're going to do this real quick. Uh, we only have a little bit more to go. Then there is the Missouri Revised Statutes that are said to be only prima facie CIE. CIE. Evidence of law. As stated, either something is or is not. When it comes to the law, there can be no be in between or possibility. As the securities and protections associated with the Bill of Rights spoke that. That ain't spoke. H O L D. Holds that no person shall be held to answer and or signify nor. See, and or signifies nor. So we're going to put and or and then we're going to put and or means nor. In this case, deprived of life, liberty, or property, signifying application of civil law, property, nor be compelled to be a witness against themselves and or subjected to double jeopardy without due process of law. This matter has been without due process of law, for this court appears to have allowed individuals to bring forth claims without a showing of evidence, relying in... Acting upon prima facie, C-I-E, okay, evidence and or presumption, presumptive evidence, which is a violation of my due process rights to a fair and impartial hearing based on facts and conclusions of law and not the appearance of law. And I object and I bring forth my challenge to this deprivation of my rights as secured by the Supreme Law of the Land, the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution, which each state must incorporate within the body of its constitutional framework. And I allege, cry, and claim that such is believed to be unconstitutional. Then there is the multiple office practice and procedures uh let's see the reply to all officers of the public trust okay which if this particular body exists without let's do this okay the multiple I don't know what, then there's the multiple office practices and procedures that apply to all officers. Give me a second, one second, I have to get this right. Sorry, I got that from a case law. So that's why it says that. Which, if this particular body exists without, during these proceedings, and we're going to do without at A-N-Y-P-O-I-N-T, during these proceedings, at any moment, Come on, it is believed that that would make the proceedings unconstitutional. So I dare to bring forth my claim that I do not believe. Hold on now. I got to wait for it to catch up. So one more again, y'all. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make me, it's going to make me beg, you know. The moment I put you on pause, it corrected itself. 
with the judicial officer presiding over these proceedings is valid. I don't believe that the office, the oath of office is believed. I believe that the oath of office is associated with a negating oath, otherwise known as definition of negative oath in English. Negative oath. So what we're going to do is because we said known as, we're going to take him and we're going to put him here. Okay. Then we're going to take him and we're going to put him there. And then we're going to take him and we're going to bring him back. Stop it. There. Okay. Now, negative confession. Okay, but we're not interested in this one. We're interested in this one right here, ladies and gentlemen. Colonia! Ladies and gentlemen, the oath that nullifies. Pay attention to that. Because basically, this oath was taken by Jews at Yom Kippur! Or the Day of Atonement. Ladies and gentlemen, the atonement was where they get the term scapegoat from. What would happen is that the high priest would bring two goats. And it would sacrifice one goat for the sins of the people. And then the other goat, it would figuratively place the sins of the people that they did the entire year, place them on that goat and send the goat out on its way. Now, it wasn't an oath. They didn't take an oath. Okay? But it became a practice that they would do. And that's what this is talking about. So it was basically a statement rather than an oath. And... So what they did is they converted it. See, the Bible says, better it is that you vow now than it vow not than you vow and do not pay. So they had to pay their vows. So what they would do is they would take a vow, and on that day, then they would untake their vow. Because the scripture says, don't vow. And so they wouldn't be bound by a vow for the whole year. So it is believed that this is what the courts are practicing, which is why they're not under their oath. As stated previously, the trustee must be registered with the SEC in order to participate in the sale and or transfer of securities. He also must have the authority and or authorization of the holder in due course. In this instance, which would be the beneficiaries and not simply a beneficiary as the note involves a mortgage-backed security and a remake. There have been no evidence of any record of any authority given to this trustee to violate the SEC's rules and regulations as well as pooling and servicing agreement. Uh-oh, I didn't mean to hit that P. Get out of here, P. And this court has failed to apply the following tests. It's called the Howie test. Howie? Howie test. Howie test is an economic reality test was designed to determine whether a particular instrument, your mortgage-backed security, is an investment contract, as we mentioned above, not whether it fits within an example of listed in the statutory definition of a security. United States Supreme Court says that it is 100% necessary to determine, like the Mississippi, Missouri state law states, whether or not this is an investment contract or a security. It is more than obvious that it is not an investment contract, as this is a was a personal loan that I acquired from the bank with my wife that we utilized to purchase a home. The home was not a security for a loan, as it was owned by a private owner for which I have documentation, who was not the bank or a financial institution. In order for this to be a home loan, the bank would have had to have had in possession, had been in possession. Let's do Ben. B-E-E-N. In possession of the home in order for me to purchase the home from the bank, which means no monies would have changed hands between myself and and the private owner. Again, this was a personal loan and not a consumer loan as is cognizable in law. However, under Missouri law, it can, however, under, uh-oh. We gotta get, that, that, that was a repeat of the same thing. Yeah, that was a repeat. That's the voice recognition. One second, y'all. 
we're almost done. However, under Missouri law, it cannot be otherwise. As Missouri law has noted above, only recognizes such a loan as an investment loan and not a security. In addition, I have already brought forth evidence that the trustee cannot engage in securities and the so-called real estate foreclosure scheme simultaneously as such is a violation of the securities laws and regulations and there is no evidence placed anywhere on the record whereby the trustee gets to operate in such a capacity. So prior to this court's choosing to issue a summary judgment, the court in this case issued a, is getting ready to issue a summary judgment. You'll see the reason why. There can be no controversy before the court before uh, there can be no controversy before the court before it enters a summary judgment order. A motion for summary judgment may only be granted when there is no facts in controversy. In consideration of a motion for summary judgment, the court views the evidence in the light most favorable to considering uh, and mo the non-moving party. The moving party has the burden of showing that there is no genuine issue of material fact. That's what this is, bringing forth genuine issue of material fact. I purchased, this is a D, a home at a foreclosure sale. This is what we're saying the opposing party is saying. Uh-oh. I purchased a home at a foreclosure sale. Does not mean that the sale was valid. As noted above, the foreclosure scheme declares a party guilty without a hearing. Since the bringing, oh no, 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 no. It was right. Since the being guilty of an unlawful detainer carries with it the deprivation and loss of property, the law requires a hearing before anyone can be deprived of any significant due process rights. That's this right here. Legitimate claim and entitlement to protect in the due process clause. The root requirement of due process is that an individual be given an opportunity for a hearing before he's deprived of any significant protected interests, due process rights. Yet, the congressional scheme is that I am already guilty, that there is no need for a hearing, that there is no need for a determination of guilt. This is a violation of due process, and yet not the 14th Amendment, but under the 5th Amendment Securities and Protections, the Bill of Rights. And... With that being said, at present, I've also filed bankruptcy, Chapter 13, to protect my security interest because of the waywardness of these proceedings. This particular court called me in for a hearing, had me preparing for the hearing, then the day of the hearing decided to place my time, or it's not place, it's supposed to be waste my time. Waste my time the court's time, and the public's time by handing me a notice saying that the hearing was being postponed. I know, I know. Give me, give me, give me the right word. Okay. I appreciate the court's wanting to save face and not putting people out of their homes it's not in it's in because they didn't want to put them out or give them a bad thing during the holidays during the holidays but the court could have given notice the day prior to the week prior or hours before the hearing but it deliberately had me waiting for whatever reason and or purpose when it had knowledge beforehand as to its intentions, even notifying the other opposing party prior to myself, which shows how unfair and uneven handed the dealings are in this instant matter. 
I am seeking for a judicial officer, the judicial officer to recuse himself, not only for the very fact that I have put forth several questions and documents before the court to which it has refused to respond to uh, while having a duty to respond. Okay, that's where he is right there. While having a duty to respond. I also notified the court of my challenging its jurisdiction and it has refused to respond and or address such a challenge. I say to the court that if I have the right to challenge the validity of the statute, that the validity of a statute, since the court is enforcing a statute, no, let's get, let's do that. It appears, since the court is enforcing a statute contrary to the Hornbrook of constitutional law, that the challenge to the statute automatically equates to a challenge to the jurisdiction of the court because to deal with, because it deals with not only personam in rem and subject matter respecting the instant matter and the court is fully and wholly aware as is judicial knowledge that it must address the concerns i further move for the court to vacate the foreclosure due to the lack of authority of the trustee and there was no power of attorney ever presented giving the trustee any authority to operate on behalf of the beneficiary as such notification and proof Nev have never been furnished my person even after demand and then we go on and on and what the Ninth Circuit Court have said about the promissory note being inseparable and under the circumstances of how you can't separate the deed from the note ladies and gentlemen I'm not going to read all the rest we did the validation and verification we finish it and there it is I will put probably the same document up online as a matter of fact I will put this document up online you guys will amend it it's called a petition challenging unlawful detainer and we'll put it in the law section. You guys will have to amend it to fit your circumstances and benefits. I am um, 12 hours doing this one document. That's why I'm gonna stop right there because I'm burnt, I'm spent. Mom, I hate that he's spent. Oh, look at that. Uh, give me a second so I can log on. I hit the pause button and didn't even Okay, I had to do the quick connect to make sure it does that from now on so I don't have to go through all these steps. What we're going to do is we're going to put it in that same folder. So give me a second, ladies and gentlemen. Um, come on. Then we're going to go down to PDF. And then I got to go take the dogs for a walk. So y'all just going to have to watch me rush. And then we're going to put it in the very first document. Uh, not law. Come on now. Legal understanding. Sorry. I could have just went here. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go here. Uh, sorry. Bunch of hard drives and everything. Uh, we're going to go quick access. Quick access is going to be the best access. And it should be the first document right there petition for unlawful detainer there you go and ladies and gentlemen we have to right click on this and we have to process q and there it is now what i'm gonna do where's my petition petition unlawful detainer that's a uh, all right we'll download the new version uh, i'll put the link underneath the video when i get an opportunity ladies and gentlemen okay have a very good day, everybody. This was for you.